I'm Carol Marshall with the Sierra Nevada Mining and Industry Council and we have with us today Jack Clark. Jack's descended from Nevada County pioneers on both sides of his family. His mother's grandfather came across the plains with a wagon train and his father's family arrived in 1863. Jack was born in 1920 and began work as a mucker at the Idaho Maryland mine on January 9th, 1941. And from there, we will let Jack continue his story. And also, I wanted to point out, Jack has written a wonderful book called Golden Quartz, The Legendary Idaho Maryland Mine. I started uh, working at the Idaho Maryland Mine on January 9th, 1941. And... Uh, I worked there for nearly 13 years altogether. Uh, I started out as a mucker. The, um, I worked in a big stope on the 1300 level. And uh, after about five weeks, they needed a first aid man. So they gave me the job. This, uh, this was a good job because it entailed uh, going around to all of the underground workings where men worked uh, on the levels that they worked, of both the Idaho, Maryland, and the Brunswick mine. And I refilled the first aid boxes and, and took care of all the fire extinguishers and things like that underground. And also on the surface, I went through the, all the shops, the uh, mills for both mines and the cyanide plant. Uh, I learned a lot about the mine because I covered all of the various levels of both mines and uh, I got more interested in it as, as time went on. Mm -hmm. I worked there uh, prior to, well, the wife and I got married oh, just a week after Pearl Harbor. So I was uh, registered 1A in the draft. And then being that we got married, which we had planned for many months prior to that, mm -hmm. um, we, uh, or I was re, uh, What did you call it, I guess? Re, uh, anyway, I was 1C in the draft. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And so that gave me a few months extra. Oh. So then, finally, I was reclassified as 1A again. So I decided I've got to do something. I don't want to go in the Army. So I went down in San Francisco and enlisted in the Navy. So I uh, was called up and spent three and a half, well, almost three and a half years in the South Pacific with the, with the Navy and mm -hmm. attached to the Marines for a while. I was, when I went to join up, they asked me what I, where I worked and I told them and they said, well, what were you doing? And I says, I was a first aid man. Well, you're a corpsman now. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, um, I worked there for a year and a half. And then the mines, of course, closed shortly after that by the government, the L-208 order by the government agencies. Mm -hmm. I um, came back to the mine after after the war was over. I was discharged in September 30th of 1945. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to go on to college at that time on the GI Bill, but I opted to go back to the mine and 
I enjoyed it with four. I enlisted, and so I worked in the shops for a couple years, and uh, then they gave me the job of safety engineer. Mm -hmm. So I spent over seven years as a safety engineer, and again, uh, I learned so much in the practical experience, not only the mining, but the all of the other parts of of mining. It was it was great. Uh, there again, I went through all of the levels of both mines. Uh, during the war, eighty percent of the Idaho Maryland mine was uh, uh, lost as far as mining was concerned. Again other than in-depth. So mm -hmm. um, I, I was, um, I learned a lot. I learned because of my uh, job, I had many uh, responsibilities that uh, you see uh, today that they're uh, complaining about a lot of the people when the mine is about to reopen. I was in charge of the uh, all of the air circulation within the mine, mm. and uh, I had the uh, responsibility of uh, the safety program for the miners. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a good safety program uh, at once, one part, there or one uh, area, we went. Uh, I forget now. It was over a year without a lost time injury, and for mining, that's that's real fine. That's wonderful. I uh, felt that uh, I wanted to learn just as much as I could, and in addition to my duties as a safety engineer, uh, the engineering department uh, uh, said that being that you're in these areas all the time, uh, we'll uh, let you do uh, some figuring up the contracts for the men, uh, miners. Now the contract uh, areas were the raises Mm -hmm. and the uh, drifts and crosscuts. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a great need to, to have the miners, the better miners were put in these locations. Oh, uh -huh. So I would, each uh, two weeks, I would go to the, those areas and uh, uh, figure up what the footage that they uh, made uh, from the last period, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted every inch that they broke in ground. I mean, they, but it, it was easy because I would measure it up, and we would talk about it, and they were satisfied. I'd go up and and uh, I hand in my sheets, mm -hmm. and then they were paid accordingly. The um, the during 1950, about 1950, uh, they also put the mine employees, the miners, on a uh, bonus type of work. Mm -hmm. The more rock they they made, the more money they made. So, I. That meant that I went through all the stopes and measured up uh, the cubic feet of ground that was broken. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted, just like the miners in the other contracts, they wanted to know just what their pay was going to be for the next two weeks. So I'd sit down and, and figure out the cubic feet of ground broken and figure what that would uh, be mm -hmm. uh, on the check. Uh, 
just about every miner that uh, uh, was making more money than he had made before, uh, or was making too much money, he thought, he'd say, well, will you cut it down some? And I said, yes. And anyway, they didn't want to be in a position where the company would cut their, uh, uh, or raise the rate of, uh, or lower the rate of the cubic feet mm -hmm. that was broken. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, the company got more cars of ore than, than what they paid the men for uh -huh. in a lot of, ca a lot of cases. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of the way the miners wanted to do it. Yeah. Uh, we uh, uh, also, uh, the engineering department, in addition to my safety work, they said, well, Jack, uh, you're there. Why don't you map the stopes at the same time? And uh, that'll save us in the engineering office. So I was happy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't an awful lot of extra work. The um, later on oh, it was the last four or five years that uh, I worked there. Uh, the engineering department, because they were cutting back uh, after the war, it was it was harder to make money for the company. They just uh, it was more costly because of the amount of uh, uh, rise in materials in mm -hmm. steel mm -hmm. and everything like that due to the war and so they wanted me to help the uh, man that was doing the survey in underground mm -hmm. the um, after helping him for a while he he explained how to run the transit and everything and uh, he said, well, he says, there's no reason why you can't do this, he said. So uh, the last four or five years, I did all of the surveying underground. This is in addition, in addition to my safety because I would be in those areas anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and it took a little extra time for what I was doing. But, uh, Did you get paid extra? No, <laughs> not at <laughs> time. <laughs> but uh, it's it saved the company, uh, the engineering department, quite a bit of money because one man, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it made a big difference. We had um, uh, the shift bosses. Of course, the shift bosses had a, a certain area that they would have to cover. Uh, I mean, they had to make two trips underground mm -hmm. to a day to go through their work areas. They were responsible for the safety of the men working in the stopes and, and uh, other areas. So they... Um, got together. They thought that they could make a little more money if they uh, if they were to not have a lost time injury in their area for a given period of time. I think it was it was monthly, I guess it was. I don't quite remember. But anyway, yes, it was monthly. They would get $25 extra mm -hmm. on their paycheck if they didn't have a lost time injury. Uh, they brought that to me, and I says, no, I don't think that's going to work. Because I said, if you have a lost time injury in, during the month, then you will slack off till the next month and uh, 
not uh, uh, want to uh, be as care careful that you prevent an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was overridden, and this went into effect, and uh, they were right. I uh, I found that it reduced our uh, injuries a lot mm -hmm. because they paid more attention, and uh, we did have a good a good uh, um, safety program. It's great. In my book, uh, it goes back to 1851, mm -hmm. uh, starting with the. Uh, company that that uh, Idaho Maryland didn't uh, uh, purchase until 1919 mm -hmm. but I felt that they were working on the same ledge mm -hmm. underground it started out uh, with that mine and uh, I looked at all of the fatalities that happened uh, from 1851 through uh, 1956 and I, I uh, came up with 15. Hmm. That, that's over a period of a long while mm -hmm. and some of that period was before the Idaho Maryland had picked up that mine. Right. Uh, that was, and uh, right. Anyway, uh, I on the safety program, I gave talks. Mm -hmm. I showed film that we had from. Uh, I would get them from the Divi division of industrial safety, and. Uh, uh, there were a lot of other things that we did mm -hmm. that, uh, that was part of the safety program. Mm -hmm. The um, there was um, times that uh, we had an injury, but if you could control people. You could have less injuries in any industry mm -hmm. because a lot of it is their fault. They're not thinking at the time or something like that. Mm -hmm. But most of them uh, can be prevented. Mm -hmm. And that was my aim to do that. Sure. We had, we had uh, an inspection every six months from the Division of Industrial Safety, uh, the mining uh, section. Mm -hmm. There was four men in the mining section. And I would take them around when they came. I would take them to the, uh, well, all through the mine, wherever they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't uh, bypass anything or anything like that. Because my feeling was, if they found something that was wrong, and I didn't overlook overlook it, it it would save somebody's life, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, John Franz was the one that came up here from San Francisco generally, and uh, he would go around and. And he'd pick up five, six things that he thought needed to be corrected, and I could have them corrected before he left. Oh my goodness. We would, uh, they're minor things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd always go to the plant manager or the manager of the mine, and he would explain to him what, his, uh, what he found, mm -hmm. and then I would have to write. A, I would get a formal letter from the state, and it was to be answered within 15 days, mm -hmm. signed by the uh, manager of the plant. 
I would uh, write up the uh, report, mm -hmm. answers, and, and go in where Craze would, would uh, sign it and it'd go back to the state. Mm -hmm. But in those days, uh, it was the Division of Industrial Safety. Now, they could call me and ask me questions like, uh, and a lot of the times they'd say, Jack, what are you doing on such and such? We want to, there's a mine uh, that, that I can pass that on to and help them. So oh, uh -huh. we, we could do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, um, it was one of these things where uh, I could, there was good uh, uh, information back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, I was working at Aerojet, and the same mining division had jurisdiction over Aerojet uh, because of the explosibility and everything of the, uh, wow. that they used there. Uh -huh. Um, but it became Cal OSHA at that time, mm -hmm. and it was just the opposite. If I, I was to, and I took them around there too, uh, in the various plant areas, mm -hmm. and if I saw something that wasn't right, I would uh, steer them away from it because, and that's not right. But you'd get a big fine mm -hmm. if they wrote it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a different person, of course, I was working with at that time. But uh, I, I don't have too much enthusiasm for Cal OSHA. Mm -hmm. I don't, because uh, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, getting back to the mine, uh, we had a hard time after the war, as a burst to prior to the war, because we had lost so much of the good ground in the Idaho, Maryland. And to flooding? No, it was, uh, the, uh, the footwall area in the Idaho, Maryland is uh, is uh, serpentine ground. Oh, okay. And the serpentine, when it's it's exposed to, when it's exposed to uh, uh, the air, mm -hmm. the the uh, or water, mm -hmm. the moisture in the air, it starts to swell. Mm -hmm. The the ground itself just keeps heaving up, and it breaks all the timber. I see. It just it, you take a. 14 inch diameter timber and break it like a match because it's constant pressure. Hmm. Uh, during the war, we had timbermen working on all of the levels, mm -hmm. three or four timbermen on each level, just repairing the timber, uh, replacing it uh, if it was getting bad. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas after the war, uh, well, it was 80% uh, pushed together. You just couldn't crawl through it. My goodness. And um, so that's the condition of the Idaho Maryland mine itself from, from 2000 level on up. Uh, so after the war, uh, they had to mine in uh, down 30 winds and, and in the and down to 3280 later on. Uh, there's a lot of quartz down there, mm -hmm. and, there's, and there would be a lot of money, but uh, it's gonna take a little uh, money to recapture some of that down in that location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another job I had was uh, the in the safety part of it, uh, the men had to have 
the first aid class once every other year, or mm -hmm. once every two years, I, I should say. Um, so the Bureau, the Bureau of Mines uh, were, the Bureau of Mines is an organization, it's a United States organization, that comes around and gives first aid classes uh, and then, uh, like myself, uh, I would have to take the first aid class, but then I'd have to take an instructor's class. Mm -hmm. And so then I would teach every half of the half of the mine would uh, uh, take it one year and half the other the next year. That way, everybody. Uh, would be have a two-year car. Oh, uh huh. And uh, so I gave. Oh gosh. Uh, we we had some of the classes up at the Elks Building because it takes a long, um, a large area, and some at the Scout Hall over in Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I gave first aid classes for, oh gosh, many, many of them. And then a mine has to have a, a mine rescue squad. Mm -hmm. uh, the mine rescue squad is picked from various miners in the mine who are willing to be on it. Uh, they are the type of people who you pick that uh, are knowledgeable of timbering, knowledgeable of the mining, and everything else, mm -hmm. underground. So uh, we had to have 10 men. I was one of them, of course, all the time, and mm -hmm. I'd be the captain of the crew. Uh, the Bureau of Mines would, would uh, be instruct all of us once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to take the training. Uh, had to have a doctor's examination mm -hmm. and be able to pass it to be able to be on the squad. Mm -hmm. uh, the training would, there was a cooperative safety station. Maybe when you're over at the Empire uh, the last building, brick building on the east side mm -hmm. of the of the whole area there, you'll see a sign cooperative safety station. Mm -hmm. Okay, they had uh, they had uh, eleven uh, McKay machines, two hour McKay uh, safety apparatus. Uh, they were, um, they weighed 37 pounds. Uh, they, uh, their safety engineer over there uh, kept, kept these up. They, and um, uh, they have, it's a machine uh, or an apparatus where you breathe your same air over and over. Uh, they're taking on a little oxygen mm. to mix with it, mm -hmm. and uh, there it is a bottle about, uh, oh, I guess five inches in diameter, and about a foot long, mm -hmm. or ten inches long maybe, of uh, heavy uh, metal, just like, uh, and it it held, oh gosh. I forget how many atmospheres of uh, of air, mm -hmm. but they were ICC regulated. They were just like any of the oxygen bottles that you buy, uh, or they met the same requirement, mm -hmm. and uh, they would be empty. 
Um, no, they were kept full. Yeah, they were full. And uh, we would put the, the machines were all broken down. We would put the bottles in, hook them up with the uh, a valve that uh, reduces it from, oh, I think it was 1,500 or something like that, uh, pounds per square inch down to what you could breathe. Uh, breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, called a reducing valve. They had, on the back of them, they had a real thick rubber uh, bag that uh, the oxygen and your, your breathing would be in and the, the valve that would emit oxygen to you as you needed it. Um, we would have to fill card oxide. It's a, it's, it's a kind of a granular powder mm -hmm. in, in a container within that. And that uh, card oxide would take out, absorb the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, then um, when you get them all together and you test them, mm -hmm. uh, and you can't cheat with them. That's one of the things that you cannot cheat because it's your life. Mm, sure. Um, now, after we would uh, get these all together, and by the way, it didn't have a mask. It just had a piece, and the rubber went in your mouth, oh, and mm -hmm. you breathe through that. Mm -hmm. uh, one tube was an inhalation tube, and one was an exhalation tube off of that. Oh, uh -huh. It had a little valve at the bottom of it that you pushed up, and uh, the body emits nitrogen, mm -hmm. and you had to get rid of the nitrogen periodically, and you did that as you, as you felt the uh, nitrogen building up, you would press that valve and blow it out. Otherwise, you just puff up, <laughs> and uh, uh, but that was the way those were, and they were. You were able to work two and a, or two hours with them. Now, when did you need these apparatuses? When For you, a fire underground. For fire underground, yeah. okay. Now, part of that practice, I mean, that instruction was that they had a long crosscut down at the Pennsylvania mine, which was a part of the uh, was a part of the um, empire. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, right where they have that trail that goes through the off of Empire Street. Oh yes, uh -huh. the mine was yeah. right close there, uh -huh. and uh, we'd go down to the ten hundred level, take old boots, uh, paper, a lot of stuff, uh -huh. and each person that have something they pack in there. And uh, there was a Braddis work there where one side would end up being uh, where you would light a big fire mm -hmm. and the other side would be, uh, of course, just good air. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, we would sit there and after lighting this fire and it would be real smoky. Oh, by the way, you had a pair of goggles on your eyes mm -hmm. with an inner circle, rubber circle, with water in the bottom of it because just wearing them, your, uh, it, the glass would, would steam up mm -hmm. and you'd have to uh, work that water around to and uh, to clean the mm -hmm. glass. But we would sit there for a while and then 
uh, we'd have to uh, do some labor type work. They had a big log there and mm -hmm. uh, saw horse and, and you take turns sawing on that. And uh, of course your heartbeat and everything goes up quite a bit. But you, you, in that instruction you find out that you can't cheat on that piece of equipment mm -hmm. because it's your life. We had what they called a hulamite that would uh, uh, check uh, check the amount of uh, carbon monoxide in the air, mm -hmm. and it'd be way above what you could what you could live in. Mm -hmm. uh, and a fire underground is terrible in a way because what it it's dampish underground. Mm -hmm. The the um, fire does not flame, it's, it smolders, the timber will smolder, mm -hmm. and it gives off a lot of smoke. Mm -hmm. And in the smoke, of course, you have your carbon monoxide, you have your, uh, you have your uh, lack of oxygen, mm -hmm. so you, you have two deadly things happening to right. you. So the men realized that. Now, during the year, about two times during the year, I would have to call out the uh, men on the team. We'd go over and get the equipment, and, uh, go through the whole thing again. Mm -hmm. and what we would do would be just walk around the surface and uh, for an hour and a half and then we'd come back and each time you wear a machine you have to clean it and you have to uh, brush out the card oxide screens and everything mm -hmm. um, and then um, you'd have to they have it. <laughs> it. It was a pump to pump up the uh, to refill the oxygen uh -huh. tanks, and one man would be on one side and one on the other. It was it seemed to be an antique type of thing, but it did the purpose. It, I mean, it, it served the purpose well, uh -huh. and we would uh, fill those. And have the machine all ready for for the next use. Now, uh, I wanted to ask you also, um, Errol McBoyle, did did he take a? He seemed to have such an active part um, in the community. Did he take a real active part with the men that worked for him, the miners? They loved him. I mean, they liked him. Um, he was good. Now, I went to work in 41, and looking back, I wish I knew or Errol McBoyle better to where I could talk with him and everything. Mm -hmm. But I would see him all the time. Mm -hmm. He'd come to the mine every day, and or most every day. Um, but I didn't, uh, other than just uh, uh, meeting him, you know, and talking to him as he went by, I, I never had conversations with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's. Would you mind talking with him? Yeah. Yes, he is. He's got people into interviewing him, big. I will. And you're no. not there in the office. Now I. Now I uh, feel that Errol McBoyle. Uh, gosh, he did so much for this area. Mm -hmm. He did an awful lot, and his name doesn't show hardly at all. That's very true. Mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately. Uh, 
there's a sign that uh, out on Brunswick Road it says McBoyle Way. It's just just the uh, little road that went up to his house, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was finally given credit at the fair board out here, and his name is, uh, I think, well, as you go in the big, uh, the first room, uh, building to the right oh, there, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. up, up, up there there's all of the people who were honored each year. Right, right. Now, his yeah. wife uh, started to get that, and it took three years, I think. I wrote letters uh, mm -hmm. saying that the, he did a lot when for the fair. They, when it was first starting over after many years it, mm -hmm. it had been, and it was behind the uh, Veterans Building here in Grass Valley. Oh. Mm -hmm. And at that time he had all of these uh, uh, Percheron horses, mm -hmm. and he brought some over with the wagon that he pulled around, and he uh, gave money for the fair to get a start. Mm -hmm. um, Errol McBoyle, uh, it was during the Depression years. He had, uh, he had the mine going, of course, and by 1941 there was a thousand men working underground. Amazing. At, at the Idaho, Maryland, and Brunswick. Amazing. During the during the uh, summer months, he he gave jobs to the uh, kids who were going to college mm -hmm. during uh, during the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, he also gave jobs to some of the high school kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the airport, he had them doing all the brushing for the runway up there. Uh, oh, he just, and, and the reservoir up there was built. It was the mine reservoir, but he put a lot of money in, in the fountain and, and the other. But he, and the ranch, he had 37 men working there all mm -hmm. the time. He was giving jobs to people just to help them. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he believed in that. They he, had, he really stimulated Nevada County's economy. <laughs> oh, he did, yes. I mean, you know, and, and these were Depression years, you mm -hmm. know. And um, uh, he had three, three gangs, we call them gangs, uh, of different people uh, and young people involved, too. And they did a lot of the labor work around the mine. Mm -hmm. uh, when they built the, built the garages for the men mm -hmm. down on the flat there, they, uh, they had uh, one of the gangs working down there just doing work, leveling off. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, the softball association. There was uh, uh, they were playing ball uh, at Hennessy Field later. What it's called Hennessy Field now. Mm -hmm. They were playing softball there at night, and they had the lights. But then uh, I forget for what reason that they couldn't have it. Oh, they were planting the grass, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want them playing on it mm -hmm. uh, because it was too, wasn't firm enough at that oh, time. Uh -huh. So they moved out to Memorial Park there. And um, so they wanted to put 
the, uh, poles up for lighting. Mm -hmm. They didn't have lighting. And so anyway, uh, they dug their holes, the association did, and then they couldn't get the poles up. They, the, the way they thought they could do it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So they called out to the Idaho, Maryland, and uh, uh, Earl McBoyle, at that time they had a uh, track, uh, like a steam shovel only, it had a crane mm -hmm. boom on it, and play, they took the shovel off, and uh, he walked that in uh, from the mine down to Memorial Park, and uh, with two men, and then he sent uh, electricians down after they had uh, put the poles in to help hook up all the lighting and everything. Huh. Wow. Never th thought a thing about it, you know. Yeah. It was for the people. Yeah. But uh, he doesn't have any credit. Now, getting back to Errol McBoyle, he built the hospital up there on the hill, which is Lytton's building. Oh, uh huh. That yeah. was to be a hospital, mm -hmm. and um, he he gave five hundred thousand uh, shares of his stock to uh, to the uh, hospital association mm -hmm. at that time. He, he formed the association in 1934 mm -hmm. uh, himself as uh, the chairman and uh, Dr. Jones and uh, three of the uh, men from the Idaho, Maryland, uh, uh, well, from their main office in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, they were board members, mm -hmm. and he, the war came along and he couldn't get any steel, so he couldn't, he couldn't uh, finish the hospital. Oh. The hospital in, uh, in 1943, he had a, a major, uh, uh, stroke. Stroke on his right side, which left him an invalid. Mm -hmm. And it was right at the prime of his life when mm -hmm. he was trying to get gold mines opened up again. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he was back in Washington uh, for three months just trying to, you know, lobby whatever he could get. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was here at the time, though, when he had the stroke. Um, so that that uh, lay idle for a long time. He still had the uh, the association members. Mm -hmm. uh, they changed, of course, and uh, there was a uh, a lot of the members then from the mine here were on that board. Mm -hmm. um, Mel Hamill, if you've heard of Mel mm -hmm. Hamill, mm -hmm. he was the chairman of it. The so he took five hundred, no, two hundred thousand dollars of the money for the sale then to Lytton uh, for that property uh, to build, go toward building a hospital for the people. Mm -hmm. He wanted the people to have a. We needed it awfully bad here. So he he uh, still had the money. He, he died in 1949, by the way, but he was able to uh, have that money within the association mm -hmm. uh, for that hospital. Mm -hmm. So in 19... Mm, 1956? I think somewhere around there, um, 
the association finally, uh, under Malcolm Hamill, said, uh, we will give you the, the $200,000, because there was a lot of people that were saying we need a hospital. Mm -hmm. And he said, we will, I will give you the money from the, uh, from Errol McBoyle as seed money if the people will raise a like amount. Mm -hmm. So they formed, they formed a 16, 17 member committee mm -hmm. uh, under the chairmanship of Errol McBoyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Mal Malcolm Hamill. They they sold debenture notes. I have one in here. Really? <laughs> wow. But uh, they they sold debenture notes, and uh, they they sold fast. Uh -huh. Within two months, they sold, and uh, they raised three hundred thousand dollars. That was their the, wow. was their goal. All right, that's amazing. And uh, then. The Idaho, Maryland mine said, we will give you 10 acres of property mm -hmm. if you wish to have it to build your hospital. And they gave the money, I mean, the acreage uh, to the hospital where it stands today. And um, the, the 500,000 built the first uh, portion of the hospital, mm -hmm. I think it was in 1948 that it was November, something like that, mm -hmm. that it uh, came, had the first patients. Um, now, Errol McBoyle doesn't have his name up there at that hospital. Mm -hmm. It's a shame. Yeah, it is. It's a shame. Um, I've been working with, over the years, with the uh, hospital people, mm -hmm. the, the CEO, or mm -hmm. whatever you call him, and they always tell me, well, you have to go to the, uh, what is it, this board? Gosh, I know it as well. Anyway, there's a board that has to do with that. Oh, wow. Uh. So I got with Jerry Angove, who's the chairman of it. And uh, see, this year's the 50th anniversary of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I feel that his name should be somewhere up there. Mm -hmm. uh, without his money, without the Without the association that still was in, that he organized, mm -hmm. without them being able to uh, raise money by dementia notes, mm -hmm. that hospital wouldn't have been built for several years mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The. The last I heard was that, well, they're going to build a building in two or three years, and, and we'll name it after Elmer Well, But mm. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I think at least they should, in during this period of time, that they have. I think it's in November or whenever the fiftieth date mm -hmm. arise, they are going to have some kind of celebration up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope at least they have his name. Yeah, that would be wonderful. He I think that deserves it. He, something should have been yeah. uh, named after him. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack, uh, tell us a, a little bit about the, the Cornish miners that you worked with. Uh, the and Cornish their miners. particular... <laughs> 
peculiarities or however you want to put it. <laughs> we had, uh, at the Idaho, Maryland, we had a lot of Cornish miners. In fact, Grass Valley, they say, uh, was about 40% Cornish at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cornish miner, I, I love to hear him talk. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time you you'd uh, come upon one of them, they'd say, how are you, pard? <laughs> or, no, how how getting on, pard? Mm -hmm. That's the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, it was uh, getting close to noon one day, uh, or time to, for lunch, and I was just getting ready to go up and eat my lunch. I always ate on the surface. And um, these, uh, one says to the other, he says, so uh, what time is her party? It's going to be just call the doctor's office. Oh, it's going to be just about another five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, uh, what time is her part? And uh, the other guy pulls out his watch and he says, just showed him the time and he says, damn if she ain't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it, it's right. time, to, time to eat. I don't think either one of them probably could tell time. <laughs> but the Cornish miners, uh, they, they weren't very well educated, of course, because they worked in the tin mines and mm -hmm. in uh, Cornwall, Cornwall. Mm -hmm. and they'd come over here and got a job. Mm -hmm. They were good miners, mm -hmm. good timbermen, mm -hmm. very good timbermen, uh, and they were good miners. Mm -hmm. But they worked at their own pace. Oh, did they? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. they did. They, when, when I first went to work, at the Idaho, Maryland, I was so surprised. Um, went down the 1300 level and uh, they sat around, sat around, and uh, I thought, gosh, aren't these guys ever going to go to work, you know? <laughs> and we were there about an hour almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so pretty soon one guy said, well, it's about time for the shifter to come around. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they'd uh, get uh, going to where they work then. Mm -hmm. It was hard to find tools. One shift to hide the tools so they'd have sharp pick or, or whatever. Oh. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then the uh, You'd have to hunt for them. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't. They're yeah. characters. Yeah. I was surprised when I first went to work at the mine. Had a lot of big rats underground. Mm. Oh, they're big devils. And uh, I noticed when they first got there to the level, they'd hang their buckets up on nails. Uh -huh. on, the overhead timbers, and, and uh, one of them says to me, you better, better get a nail and get your bucket up there, kid. He said, well, the rats will get it. Oh my goodness. And uh, then at lunchtime when you're sitting there eating, and the rats would be there, they'd feed them across mm -hmm. <laughs> the bread. My goodness. Um, Jack, when you go down um, pretty far into the mine, did it get warmer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Uh, in the upper part of the mine, the temperature ranged, like in the Brunswick now, for instance, it, it ranged in the about 56 degrees. Mm -hmm to have a relative humidity of, 50, uh, of uh, 40 percent, something like that, mm -hmm. 15, 20 percent. 
and it gets warmer as you went underground, mm -hmm. uh, like down to 3,000, 3,280. The temperature ranged around 67 degrees. Oh, uh -huh. And it, it, uh, the relative humidity around 80%. My goodness. So it was warmer mm -hmm. and it was more humid. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were lucky, we had good air circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, the air went down the Brunswick shaft and up the Idaho shaft. Oh, wow. So it, uh, it cleaned the mine out after blasting real fine. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was good. 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 Okay, how are we doing on time? We've only got about three more minutes left. Oh, okay. Well. Then we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. And thank you very much, Mr. Jack Clark. Oh, you're you're a wealth of information. <laughs> well, yes. And uh, I, I know that uh, you're a big help with the present corporation trying to get the Idaho Maryland going. So. Yes, I, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of gold down there. Mm -hmm. I would like to see the mine open again. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a real clean operation as a verse of what you hear and read in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, I have helped to mine people out there in gold. Uh, they call me periodically and mm -hmm. want to know something. They have a lot of maps, have a lot of reports. Mm -hmm but they haven't been down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell them what the conditions are in different parts of the mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to help them all I can. Sure, it's, that's, that's great. It's, it's going to help this area immensely if the mine can reopen. Oh, yes, and yes. Immensely. I think so, too. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you very much.